All right, everybody, we are going to kick off this episode in just one minute. Please make sure you hit that like button, hit that share button, get the word out, invite a few friends, because uh, we are going to be talking about uh, the May Day rent strikes. Uh, we're going to be talking about the Amazon and Target uh, sick outs that are coming up. And we're going to talk about YouTube censorship. We are going to be talking about all these topics today. So if those are of interest, hit that like button, hit that share button, and we'll be kicking off here in just a moment. All right, everybody, we're back. We're back at it. We're kicking things off. Let's do it. Hello. Uh, welcome to uh, Road Reflections, uh, episode 102. We're in the centennial, baby. We made it. We did it. Uh, <laughs> uh, thank you guys for tuning in. Thank you guys for um, continuing to watch and share and comment. Uh, and all that stuff, uh, I encourage you to do that throughout this episode. And uh, not that this has been a problem, but uh, I figure I should put it out there anyway. Uh, but please keep it civil. You know, try to have some discourse. Try to uh, be be good to each other in the comment sections. Um, but uh, not not that that's been a problem. I don't. Uh, there there's very rarely do I find. Uh, that people are mean or callous in in the comment sections of these things. Um, I you know I do if if you have a different opinion than me, uh, feel free to share that. As long as you're not calling me an asshole or something like that, I'm not going to do that to you. I'm not going to do that. Period. I, I just don't see any value in it. Uh, period. But. Um, yeah, I, I'm gonna be. Uh, we're gonna be. We're gonna be chatting and uh, to do a quick check-in. Uh, the mornings are always tougher, uh, especially the last couple of days. I think um, I have a thing where every like every spring and fall, I'll I'll wake up all groggy and stuffy, and I'll sneeze for about 108 minutes straight. Um, and uh, this year, it's kind of just been the stuffiness. Uh, so it's been a little bit of a difficult, uh, endeavor to get out of bed and I'm not, I'm not particularly like a morning person period. Um, I don't like, uh, waking up too early. I like, usually though, the MO that I have is to wake up between, you know, like eight and nine or something along those lines. Um, I do, I like to be, you know, I do like to get myself up and going and, and stuff like that, but it's been, uh, it's been a little bit of a challenge. It's getting better, uh, you know, day by day. Uh, but other than that, you know, everything's everything's uh, as good as it's going to be. The eyes are getting better. Uh, yesterday, I was able to um, get through a majority of the day as well uh, without the without the aid of glasses. Um, but it but I did I did hit a pretty uh, pretty. <laughs> uh, pretty big wall uh, by the end of the uh, the night there um usually uh you know i will uh make these videos and i usually make this video like you know late morning early afternoon kind of thing um and then i'll you know chop them up get all the clips ready and while i'm um converting and uploading and get, doing all of that sort of stuff i'll usually try to exercise um, while doing that, cause I can do like a round of, um, a round of, uh, you know, exercises and then I'll come back and f do whatever I need to do on the YouTube thing. Uh, and then the evenings and the, you know, after the exercising and all that stuff, I'll go shower, I'll eat, um, I'll get ready to watch the premiere with you guys as I'm doing now. And then I'll, uh, spend the rest of the evening, um, either, uh, writing or drawing or editing, um, or getting ready to, you know, do tomorrow's show or, or so on and so forth. Uh, so, uh, you know, and usually my, my evening ends between 10 and midnight and it really depends on the day. 
um, and really depends on what I've been doing <laughs> and really depends on how tired I am. Uh, and it also depends on how long these videos end up being. Um, but uh, yeah, I, you know, so yesterday I kind of tapped out around 1030, 1045, where I just, I just couldn't, you know, keep a, an eye on the screen. I tried to switch to the sunglasses. That didn't really work out either. So the eyes are getting better. They're improving. I, you know, I think they're like the, my eye strength is coming back, but I'm still going to be careful and uh, continue to wear these uh, while I'm doing um, extra screen work, while I'm doing a lot of the reading that I need to do and uh, things of that sort. So uh, yeah, but other than that, I'm doing pretty solid. Uh, just as a reminder, this Saturday, I'm going to be doing my Zoom test show, the Zoom test stand-up comedy show. Um, there are a few spots available. I think there's like five spots available or something along those lines. Um, and I think I might send personal invites to a few people that have talked to me, or I might try to push them to get the ticket link thing. Um, the only reason I'm saying go through the ticket link is because it's going to make things a lot easier. It's just going to consolidate all of, um, my communication with you guys. Uh, so, you know, it's free, uh, because this is the test show. It's going to be kind of short. Um, because it is the test show, I'll probably do a couple jokes and one of the segments that I want to do during the show, um, and basically, uh, see, you know, what are some issues that will pop up that I need to be prepared for and how I can alleviate them. Um, so that's essentially what the test show is. We're, we're, you'll get some material, you'll get some, um, some of the segmenty things that I want to do. Uh, and, uh, and, and then a, a little Q and a at the end. So if you want to participate in that, uh, the link is in the description. I will put a link in the comments as well. Um, so, uh, you know, feel free. And then I'll, I'll figure out what date to do the real show. The real show will be anywhere between 45 and 60 minutes, maybe a little bit longer than an hour. I'll probably end up doing a Q and a session with that as well, um, just so there's a little bit more of an interactive element to it. Uh, again, the reason I want you to get the tickets is because it is going to make it a lot easier for me to communicate with you and make sure that you have the, the Zoom meeting ID and the Zoom password to get into the, into the show itself um, so that we can kind of prevent um, any sort of uh, disruptions. Because the public uh, Zoom meetings do end up having a bit of a disruption. And it's annoying. Uh, and it's not fun. And I don't want anybody to be disrupted through it. So so there's that. Going to be working on Forkful. Going to be working on Taboo Table Talk. I'm doing a small business series. And I haven't fully decided how I'm going to execute this. I might end up having to do... Because um, it'll be multi-episodes. It'll be like three or four episodes based on how many people have uh, decided they want to talk about, you know, how small businesses are affected in this uh, quarantine time of ours. Um, and so um, I might do like a day of extended dispatch and then a day just with the interviews. Um, I think that's how I want to do it. But I, but you know, as most of you know, on Thursdays, I don't do these videos because that's my day to kind of work on Taboo Table Talk, work on Forkful of Noodles, work on writing and some other projects. So uh, I have all day tomorrow to kind of think about it and evaluate how I would like to move forward uh, with the um, with the small business uh, quarantine session. Uh, so so stay tuned. Those are those are all coming out. Um, and uh, I might also just put the links up for uh, the podcast as well, um, just because I, you know, if people don't know where to find them, um, they, you know, they, that's readily available, boom, right in the comment section there. Uh, so if you're in the comment threads, um, it's also in the description of the episode, but I'll, I'll leave it in the comment threads for uh, the sake of convenience. Um and uh oh one final little thing this right here that's the my instagram and twitter handle uh if you want to follow me on there you can uh, you, you can you can do that 
uh, uh, that's, you know, that's always helpful. That's always nice. Um, yeah. So, all right. With that d- out of the, the check-in done, let's dive into the episode. Uh, so, right now, um, there is a, uh, a plan for May Day, uh, International Workers' Day, which is May 1st. Uh, it's not really a day that people in America celebrate. Like, I think the rest of the world celebrates it, but America is just sort of just like, no, we're going to do the Star Wars thing instead. Star Wars is coming up. You guys want to do the Star Wars thing? Yeah, let's do that one instead of the International Workers' Day thing. Let's, which, like, I don't have anything against Star Wars. I think Star Wars is fine uh, out of the, I, I think I'm more of a Star Trek guy at this point. Uh, that I am a Star Wars guy. I like the original movies. Empire is great. Return of the Jedi, very much enjoyed that. The initial trilogy is fine. It's fine. Uh, The sequel trilogies is not... I didn't care for them. Uh, Not because there's a Lady Jedi or anything. That's fine. We've had Lady Jedis before. If you watch the animated series, there's a Lady Jedi. If you watch, uh, you know, Ashoka Tano is a Lady Jedi. I like Ahsoka, you know, um, but uh, that trilogy was uh, not cohesive, not well written, not well directed. And uh, there's some cool parts in it. There's some cool parts in it. I won't deny that. But as a whole, the trilogy is uh, not great. It's uh, a lot of hot garbage, lots, lots and lots of hot garbage. and pretending like we didn't have strong female characters in the past, uh, which we totally fucking did. Anyway, that's not the point. <laughs> uh, but International Workers' Day is coming up. May 1st, International Workers' Day is coming up, and uh, there is a rent strike that is being planned uh, for International Workers' Day, for May Day, uh, because that's going to be the next day that rent is going to be due. Um And so I know we talked about rent strikes before. I know we talked about the concept of rent strikes before, just uh, a a week or so ago, maybe. Um, You know, and I want to remind people what a rent strike is. A rent strike is not just you going, I declare rent strike. It's not just you screaming into the sky or it's not an individual person saying that they're not going to pay their rent. Uh, it is a uh, organized group of tenants that are engaging in a collective refusal of rent, either partially or fully, um, and it has to be organized. It has to be organized because if it's not organized, uh, you know, then you're, there, the, the, there is a heightened risk of facing evictions. There is a heightened risk that you will be uh, pulled out of your uh, apartment, that you will face penalties later on, that you will be evicted once we're out of this pandemic situation. Um, because we do have a moratorium on evictions. They are, they are saying you can't evict anybody uh, if they don't want to pay rent, which is, um, which is very nice of them to do, I guess. Um, but, um, you know, it needs to go beyond that. Uh, it, that that's very short-sighted uh, plan. So that's why we, that's, that's why if you are a tenant in your, in your situation, in, in, in that situation, you should organize with the other tenants. And we will talk about uh, what steps you can take if you want to organize a rent strike uh, in your community, in your building. And this is primarily against corporate landlords, by the way. Primarily against corporate landlords and uh, bigger, like, real estate companies, bigger property development companies. Um, there's one in Pittsburgh that uh, I, I very much hate because they took away a really amazing venue, a really amazing black-owned venue in East Liberty of Pittsburgh. They um, fucking, uh, what do they call Capital, uh, Walnut Capital. They suck. Don't support them. Uh, they are a, uh, uh, what I would like to say very politely, are a bag of bastards. They are a bag of bastards. Um, and, you know, how do you make a successful rent strike? Uh, the key to it is solidarity surrounding agreed demands. That's what it has to be. It has to be solidarity surrounding agreed upon demands. Uh, so why would we need a rent strike? Right, because there's a lot of people that are like, this is ridiculous. A rent strike is pointless. You shouldn't be doing a rent strike. Um, 
you know, this is, uh, this is un-American, unconstitutional, it's not freedom, it's, co it's communism, you're bringing the Red Scare into the Americas. Um, well, let's look at some numbers of what's going on and why we would need something like this. Uh, 10 million people got laid off, right? And right now, the, the Fed, uh, the Federal Reserve, is predicting the unemployment numbers to reach at 32%. That's Great Depression level shit. Uh, that's <laughs> you know, um, that's that's a that's a depression. That's a cr that's a total crash of the economic system, of of the quote unquote economic system, the the made up economic system. Um, Thirty five million people will lose their employee related health care. Uh, and you know this is sort of. A heart, I, I, don't, I don't really think there's any, anyone that can convince me against this thought. Um, if, if healthcare has to be tied into your employer, uh, that's not freedom. That's not choice. That's not the freedom of choice. That's corporate authoritarianism. That's all it is. That's a hostage situation. That means that these corporations, these, these big businesses, these industries can treat the worker however the fuck they want. And if they do something like a strike, if they push back with trying to unionize, um, try to collectively bargain, then these companies get to hold health care uh, and their families as, as, as hostages, essentially, to say, oh, well, you can go on the strike, but you're going to lose that health care. You're going to lose that job. If you lose that job, you lose your health care. That's not choice, okay? Uh, having having your health care tied into um, into your employment is not freedom. That's corporate authoritarianism, and that's holding your health and your family and your family's health as a hostage. And you know, there's a lot of people that that want to keep their employee related health care uh, instead of nationalizing a system where no matter what happens, you still have health care, you still have access to it, you can still go to the doctor, you can still go to a hospital, there's no medical debt involved. Um, and there's a bunch of people that are like, no, we can't do that. We can't have that. That's crazy. That's over the top. That's ridiculous. Uh, that's communism. And that's also uh, Americans having Stockholm Syndrome against the corporations that have held their health and family at hostage. That's basically what that is. And that's another thing, right? Uh, there are so many bills that people have to pay that $1,200, Steve Mnuchin comes out and says, oh, that's supposed to last 10 weeks. Is What are you talking about? That proves that the oligarchs don't understand how money and time works, right? Somebody should have just been like, no, Steve, that's it, it, takes, you, it takes you 10 weeks to get through $12 million, and they're like, oh, 12, oh, 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 thousand, hundred, million, whatever, it's all meaningless to me, because uh, I have so much money, and I never have to worry about it, like, that's how these people think, right, they just don't understand what it is, they don't understand the struggle that people have to go through every single day, um, you know, so along with rents, you have car payments, you have credit card payments, you have uh, medical debt that's not going away, all of these things when people don't have jobs. Um, so, you know, that is, that is why we need a, a rent strike. That's why, we're, that's why people are organizing. That's why people need to stand in solidarity with each other. Um, you know, so, so what are the basic demands for rent? First off, first and foremost, um, rent suspension. Uh, right now, there's some places that are doing moratoriums on rent. Um, and that basically means the landlord's like, don't worry about paying me now. You can pay me whatever, uh, whenever you can, but you're just, but it's, it's essentially back pay, right? So we get into this situation. People don't have jobs. They lose their income. They can't pay their rent in April. The landlord says, well, that's okay. We can't evict you. You pay me whenever you can. We'll, we'll add this to the end. So now what? Uh, so now if, you know, if you paid first month's last month's and then put down a deposit, uh, like a security deposit, well, then that's great. The security deposit gets used for this 
rent, but then it can't be used when you move out to a different apartment. So that still doesn't really help. It still puts you in that cycle of debt and bullshit. And then we come out of the situation and people can go back to, um, you know, making an income. But that means that they're going to have to spend a month just trying to earn rent. That's not helping the people. And even if they have to, so, so now what? So now they start a payment plan. So on top of car loans, on top of a possible credit card bill, on top of b uh, utility bills, which are also in the same status as this rent, they have to add another bill on top of that. I'm sure there's a bunch of people, oh, well, they should just work harder. Yeah, a lot of Americans work two jobs. There's people that work at warehouses. There, there are people that have full-time jobs. There are people that work 40 hours a week and then will have to drive for Uber. We'll have to do DoorDash. We'll have to go and work the night shift, um, you know, at, uh, at some security company or work the, work the evening shift at a grocery store. I fucking did that, and it was a nightmare. I was exhausted. I never saw, uh, I, never, I never got to spend time with my girlfriend for a while. I, I was barely doing comedy. I was incredibly unhappy, incredibly unhappy. And that's the status that America wants people to live in because that's American exceptionalism, I guess, is overworked, underpaid, completely exhausted and morally destroyed fucking working class people so that some one person can get rich. These back payments don't work. These back, these back payments are not going to uh, help. What they do is they do secure that the status quo was put into place. And the status quo is the reason why we are in this in the first place. So why would you want to go back to the status quo? It's an illogical argument to keep making. So here's how the system works, right? The renters pay the landlords. The landlords pay the banks. Um, the banks got $5 trillion. The banks of Wall Street got $5 trillion immediately like no question they didn't have to go fill out a fucking form they didn't have to go to a website that was barely functioning they didn't have to wait uh on on a phone call for two three hours like most americans did just to get their 1200 bucks just to get their unemployment they just got it congress was like dunzo the fed was like we just invented money we did we did one of these and the money was there. We went into a hat and we pulled out a big fucking check and just handed it to the banks. No problem. The banks already had the money. So if the landlord is worried that they're going to have to pay the bank back, the bank already has the money. They don't fucking need your money. They don't need the renter's money. And they don't need the landlord's money. What this could be is if you're a small business landlord, you should stand in solidarity with the renters and say, I'm calling for a mortgage strike. The banks got $5 trillion bailed out, and now they want more money, more money which we don't have. And this is, by the way, the way that this economy is supposed to work, right? The bottom takes care of the top, essentially. The bottom is, is the foundation that everything else is built on. And now they're asking the bottom to handle more weight. And physically speaking, that's impossible. It's, it's become a top-heavy system, and it's doing this. Oh, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to fall. It's going to topple. That's where we are. We're at the topple point. Um, and basically, we're saying, we're not going to catch you. We're going to let you collapse. We're going to let you crash. Why would we fucking catch you? Now you could, now the other argument can be made, well, the landlords got the small business loans. They were able to, these small business landlords were, well, they didn't. Nobody did. <laughs> Seriously, nobody did. I'm, I'm doing these conversations with the small business owners and nobody is getting anything. If they're getting something, it's like 
these minute, small little amounts. And the SBA loans were like, oh, it'll cover, a, you know, payroll. It'll be $1,000 per employee or something along those lines. It'll give you a maximum of $10,000 or you can you can have loan free 10,000 but then everything up to the uh, after that is going to have to be paid off um you know so it's like and and it wasn't anything special that you couldn't have gotten before before this crisis in the first place so you know this and this crisis wasn't caused by the middle class it wasn't caused by the working class people so why are the working class people being punished for for this crisis in the first place why are we having to bear the brunt of it the, the SBA loans did go to um, big corporations. Ruth Chris Steakhouse, Seascape Factory, Subway, Olive Garden. They got, they got, they got the, the money, and they're and 100% guaranteed they'll never have to pay it back. They'll never have, even though they probably can, right now they could pay it back. They could have paid the loan back before they even fucking got it. But instead, not only do they get these loans, but then they also, they're going on a rent strike. These corporations are doing a rent strike. In their own little way, they're doing it too. There's cases where Subway, Cheesecake Factory, places like that, that basically said, hey, we're not paying rent for April. Too bad, so sad, go fuck yourself. Ask the you know, the, the mom and pop pizza shop next door to pay their rent and that'll cover ours. Double up on them. Don't come to us. We're Subway. We're a small, we're a small business. If Subway is a, a small business, then I'm a fucking power lifter. I'm I'm Arnold Schwarzenegger circa 1982. Cheesecake Factory, they basically said we're not paying. And then they were just like, we're probably not going to pay May. And if you have a problem with it as a landlord, then you can deal with it because we're not leaving. And these guys not only got bailed out by a corporate slush fund, but they also acquired a small business loan. And they got a check as dense as the red velvet cheesecake that they served for nineteen ninety nine. So really, if anything, these small business landlords that are complaining and they look at things like a rent strike as a blow to them, they should be looking at that and saying, you know what, I'm going to join in. And I'm going to push back against the banks. Because the banks are, 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 are threatening my house and my business and my industry. And I applied for this small business loan and it went to a corporation that was already refusing to pay its rent in the first place. And nobody fucking said anything about it. Nobody shits on them. Nobody sits there and says they're unconstitutional and they're being un-American and this, that, and the other thing. Nobody sits there and says, oh, liberty, 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 freedom, 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 protesting outside. Nobody does that shit for Subway or Cheesecake Factory or Olive Garden or anything like that. They only get pissed off when the working class do it. When the working class people stand up, there's all this propaganda about socialism and, and, and how socialism is communism and conflating that fucking argument. They do the Red Scare, the McCarthyist bullshit over and over again. They confuse people about what these ideas actually are. Nobody goes after the corporations. The other half of it, too, is a rent freeze is the other thing that they're talking about, which basically means there's not going to be an increase in rent. And this should be a universal idea. Nobody should be increasing rent right now, right? Like, just because the, we, we talked about this when we talked about the, the movement for a people's party is if you're going to do a universal basic income, then that comes with rent control. Just because somebody's getting, you know, um, for the sake of simplicity of math, $1,000 a month. Just because somebody's getting a thousand dollars a month doesn't mean that you get to increase your rent by seven hundred dollars. That's not the point. The system is trying to create an e equality through um, finances, and if you jack up your rent, that's not that's not creating equality. You're just furthering the problem. And the universal basic income 
isn't the problem. Your fucking greed is. And your fucking greed has always been the problem. So um, let's look at uh, how you can organize something like this. So if you're, if you're saying, you know what, I'm seeing a lot of people in my building. Uh, we're owned by this corporate landlord. We're owned by this, this, this uh, real estate company that owns 12, 13 buildings. Um, you know, and they're threatening to raise our rents. They're threatening to back, you know, they're threatening to evict us after all this is done, blah, blah, blah. Um, and you want to push back here. Here's what, uh, Shama Savant, uh, socialist council member in Seattle who has successfully pushed back against Amazon, uh, who has successfully ensured that people don't get evicted in the winter, uh, in Seattle. Uh, she's great. She's fantastic. I wholly support everything that she's doing. Um, plus she is, uh, she's an Indian lady. So it's fucking double solidarity on that front, right? Like more Brown representation. Uh, and not just that more fucking, more fucking worker solidarity, Brown representation. <laughs> you can't fucking defeat that shit. More socialist worker supported fucking working class Brown solidarity. That's, that's what that is. Uh, so they, uh, she did a, a, a live stream the other, the other week, uh, last week, um, and I was watching most of it and, uh, there's a lot of stories about people, um, that are, you know, in a pretty tough position, um, and uh, what they're doing there, you know, uh, there's a lot of tenants unions that are, um, uh, that are organizing this rent strike. We saw the LA tenants union, uh, that Rompel Cohn, uh, showed on his page that they were protesting and they were calling for a rent strike. They were calling for uh, essentially corrupt landlords to get what they deserved, uh, calling for a rent freeze. Um, so here's how you can organize something like this, especially for May Day, right? For, for May 1st. Um, a bunch of places have done this, Philadelphia Tenants Union being one of them. Uh, there's another one called Unite Here 23 in Alexandria, Virginia. Uh, that is also doing that. And so let's take a look. Uh, so here's what it starts. Starts with a discussion with your fellow tenants to aim to get commitments uh, from preferably a supermajority or just a majority. So anywhere between 50 and 75% is what you want to aim for. Um, that gives you, you know, solidarity. That gives you more people that, um, that you know are in a tough position uh, that will... Uh, sign off on something like this and we'll, we'll, we'll essentially stand with you. And the, and the more numbers there are, the better it is. Right. Uh, so you should have what we talked about earlier, which is a set of demands clearly, clearly written out, uh, so that there isn't any sort of like loopholes that, that you can use, or they can't say like, Oh, look at this. This is not really organized. This is, so silly, like you're, you don't even know what you're doing and they can kind of trash you that way. So form, form a list of demands first and then approach it from there, right? Then go to your, then go to your tenants, um, and talk to them, show them what you, what you're working with, uh, have one-on-one -on -one conversations with each person sharing your situation, ask them how they are taking care of their needs and their family. Um, and then ask them to sign a demand letter. So again, that's going to help kind of legitimize this thing. Uh, so then make sure that every person who signed gets a phone call within 24 hours to welcome them and explain how they can get involved. Uh, give them a link to, to, to share with them, brainstorm when they can use group text, drive daily content, updates, video links, um, action announcement, uh, keep sending out the domain letter. Because if you remember one of the things, um, that gets people kind of excited, like on board with the idea of strikes, on board with the idea of these labor movements, is that it has to be present in their face, is that people have to um, see it pretty constantly. Like it has to be in front of them um, and then they can go, yeah, okay, this seems like this is doable. If it's just sort of a, a, it happens here and there, the attention span of people is not that high. So if it's constantly in their face, then it's like, okay, yes, let's do this. Uh, organize a weekly Zoom chat, um, help train tenant to become spokesperson for the struggle. So, so helping people like become better public speakers too, 
um, or finding someone that is a good public speaker that can collect these stories. And when, you know, somebody needs to be the public speaker, they have these stories. You know, Mrs. Jones from Apartment 4A, uh, she has two kids. She's a single mom. She lost her job. She was, uh, she, you know, she was an, an accountant. Um, can't really do any of that. She was a, 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 a you know, solo business person. Um, now she's got uh, her kids, she's got bills to pay, she's got food, she's got mouths to feed. You know, her, her ex-husband is MIA, he's disappeared from all this stuff. We don't know where he's at. And she's struggling and she needs a little bit of help and, and not having to pay rent, not having to worry about back pay on rent is gonna really help this person out. Um, you know, stuff like that. And I just kind of made that story up there, but you know, somebody that knows how to talk um, with these stories so who are your fellow tenants if you live in a large building then the tenants are just uh the just the people that live in the building um do you know if the building is owned by a corporation or uh that owns other buildings in the neighborhood cities if yes then you can try and contact tenants in other buildings and you can find out uh from property records research online there's a lot of these corporations that walnut capital that i mentioned owns a shit ton of buildings in the city of pittsburgh and they, uh, they're a little bit easier to find because they fucking plaster themselves, you know, like they have their name up on all the buildings that they own. Um, so, yeah, uh, if you live in a small property, then you will need to reach out to uh, the landlord's other properties. So if you have like a small business landlord or... If you know that it's kind of a if it's if it's a person that kind of owns a bunch of different properties, um, then you know you gotta you gotta talk to the you gotta figure out where these other properties are. That might not be as public. It might be in that property record search though. Um, so the last point is if you live in a landlord's only property, then unfortunately it is extremely unlikely a rent strike will work. And a negotiation is the best bet, but you should still get connected uh, with the rent strike movement. Um, so for her, you can contact her city council office. There's also Rent Strike 2020. You can look that up. That is a organization that is um, collecting signatures and um, you know getting this rent strike movement going, teaching people how to organize a rent strike, uh, and they have some valuable resources um, uh, on on their website as well, and that's something that Shama Savant uh, has, um, you know, organized with, that, that she has kind of worked, work, worked with together. Uh, so what are, what are some things that we should be concerned about in terms of a rent strike? Uh, right now there's a moratorium and eviction, but, but what's gonna happen afterwards? That's kind of the concern that I think a lot of people are gonna have. It does open the doors uh, for these landlords to say that they are going to evict people um, that go on strike. Kind of the same thing of, of when people go on strike at, at their jobs, they can lose their jobs, right? Um, these corporations or these, these landlords can make the same claim. Uh, but I think that's a reality regardless let's say you can't make a payment plan. Let's say you can't pay back your back rent within 90 days or 120 days or how much ever little leeway they give you. Or your payment plan doesn't really add up because you can't afford to take on another debt right now. You were, I mean, there's so many people that can't afford a $400 emergency. They can't afford a $1,000 emergency. Do you really think that adding on another debt, especially a rent debt or a mortgage debt, is, is, is going to fucking help people? They're scathing by as it is. They were just getting by as it is. Okay. Are you going to increase people's wages by 50 60% once we come out of this thing? How are small businesses supposed to do that when they didn't receive any fucking money? They're not looking to do that shit. So right now we have to fight for what's, 
what we have to fight for, which is right now it's a rent suspension and freeze. We have to demand this stuff. We have to fight for what's right. And, you know, we can't wait till people are getting kicked out of their homes. People are getting evicted out of their apartments. You got to do it now. You got to do it so that in the future, th it doesn't give them an opportunity to do that. That's why these rent strikes are important. That's why we should be standing in solidarity with each other. And if you're a landlord, then you should be fighting to not get your building foreclosed on. To make sure that a mortgage strike is part of this. That the word rent can be substituted for mortgages. So now homeowners can be involved in this. The numbers just keep getting bigger at this point, right? So some people are saying, oh, it's unconstitutional. You can't, uh, it's property rights. It's private property rights. Um, you know, you can't do that. You can't ask them to, um, you know, th this is private businesses. They can operate the way that they want to. Um, you know, you can't do something like this. It's unconstitutional. Um, is it unconstitutional to ask people to give up a majority, if not all of their income, and then bail out the corporations that have been making hand over fist even before all of this stuff, that have the money to get through a crisis like this, that can get through a crisis like this, that hide their money on offshore accounts in Delaware? Isn't that unconstitutional? And if it's not, then maybe we need a new fucking constitution. Maybe we need to rewrite some shit. Maybe we need a better working class constitution. Maybe we need a working class bill of rights. We need a bill of rights that's actually going to, to, to matter to people. And not just when it comes to corporations. We don't turn a blind eye when Subway doesn't want to pay their rent. And say, okay, that's fine. We don't turn a blind eye when the Small Business Association gives fucking loans hand out loans to bigger corporations, to chain restaurants. And by the way, you can replace the word constitutional with the word American, same fucking thing. We need a, we need a better America, if that's the case. So I encourage you, if you're, if you're a small business landlord, that is looking at this situation and going, what about me? You know, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to gouge people's rents. I'm trying to keep my building uh, intact. I'm trying to keep ownership of my building. I'm trying to feed my family as well. Well, I encourage you to stand in solidarity with these renters and demand for a suspension and freeze of mortgages. I mean, really, how powerful of a display would that be? You got renters, you got small business landlords and you have homeowners standing up against fucking real estate giants and banks and how i mean if we did this on a national level how big of a display would that be how big of a display would that be if it was residential and commercial renters homeowners small business landlords standing up for more ethical more compassionate, more understanding housing rights. What kind of change do you think that would make for the future? That when we come out of this, that we don't need to go back to that status quo, that we can look at some alternative ideas, that we can look for some better ideas. This is to try to look for a, a way beyond this pandemic. This is to look for a, a plan for a better future and creating a, a better America, a literal United States, a solidarity states of America rather than this corporate state of America that we're living in now. That's what this rent strike is fighting for. That's why May Day is going to be important. All right, we're going to go to our next story. I actually do have three stories for you guys today. Uh, the last one is probably going to be a, little, a lot shorter, um, but I think it's an important one that we need to talk about. So, um, so uh, we're, we're, we're seeing more Amazon and Target 
sick outs, strikes, walkouts. Um, rightfully so. Uh, so to kind of play a little recap, we, we saw earlier uh, in the month, at the end of March, early May, early April, uh, we saw that, um, you know, uh, Amazon in Staten Island, uh, they were striking. They, they, they did a wildcat strike. They walked out during lunch. Um, and they basically said that we're, we're done with this shit. They're, they're, they're not putting us in a safe work environment. Um, somebody was sick in the Staten Island warehouse. The upper management told, you know, uh, the, the upper upper management basically told the people that were managing the warehouse to 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 to, to ignore it they just said send that person home um, and don't worry about the rest of it keep working keep processing orders keep sending shit out uh, and they were like no this is bullshit and they organized a walkout and they walked out um, and then Chris Smalls who was the organizer of that walkout uh, got fired for quote unquote not practicing safety uh concerns not practicing social distancing is what they claim now this is literally the company that found out somebody had COVID 19 and said keep working anyway in tight quarters at the obscene hours that they make these warehouse employees work obscene hours with their timed pee breaks And then every day at 3.15 p.m., there's a, a video screen that gets pulled down from the ceiling, and it's just got a picture of Jeff Bezos, and, and then it, it's like a, uh, and then it turns into a gif of Jeff Bezos just staring at you and then just laughing, and staring at you and then laughing. And then you have to bow to, uh, to that, um, and then everybody collectively has to prick their fingers and drop a little bit of blood into a vial um, that gets then put into a, a box, uh, an Amazon box, and shipped to Jeff Bezos so that he can, uh, I don't know, uh, do something with it. Uh, maybe bathe in it, uh, blood orgy drink it. I don't, I don't know. You know, I don't know what sociopaths like to do with the blood of the working class. These are the working conditions. Uh, that <laughs> um, that's obviously a joke. There might be some people that take that shit too seriously. Uh, but the working conditions are fucking terrible at Amazon. Uh, so now what we're looking at, as of yesterday, as of yesterday this happened, is an additional 350 Amazon workers are going on strike at 50 more locations. Um, so that's a, that's a good amount of people. That's a good amount of people that are doing it. Um, and you know, I, uh, have, I hate buying shit from Amazon to begin with. Um, you know, there've been certain times I'll admit it. I've had to be forced to fucking use Amazon and, uh, I really do my best not to because he is a goddamn monster. Um, and he is an, a callous, uncaring, just fucking douche nozzle. I hate, I just fucking hate this guy so much. Um. Uh, so, I, I mean, you should stand in solidarity and you should stop ordering shit from Amazon. That's my opinion. Um, if you really want to see a change in the world, then use something different. Find a local place that you can get your dildos from. I'm sure that there is an adult mart. Uh, is, I mean, Adam and Eve might be selling some dildos. You know, if it's that imperative that you get your uh, cock-shaped glassware, then, you know, find a, a, a local mom-and-pop uh, cocksmith and have them, you know, construct a, a, a nice, um, you know, homemade dildo. Which, by the way, that is one of the complaints of the Amazon strikers, too, is that there's too many non-essentials. Uh, and most of these warehouses do uh, ship out sex toys. America's America's uh, known for its priorities. May it be good or bad, mostly bad, but it, it's known for those priorities. Uh, <laughs> there's a local coalition of organizers that are representing these workers called Athena. That's who has been uh, organizing these strikes. 
And um, basically what these workers are asking for is uh, a shutdown of the warehouses. And the warehouses should be um, sending out essential goods only. Um, you know, so like we're going to have to deal with, you know, one-year-old dildos, you guys. We're just going to have to deal with that. It's going to be okay. I promise you. It's going to be okay. You don't need the top of the line fucking Lexus of vibrators this month. You'll be okay with the same old, uh, you know, vibrators that you've had uh, or lotions for dudes. I don't know. I don't know what dudes are, are but it's a lot of sex toys and, and you, you just keep the ones that you have. You know, just hold on to the one. You don't need to spend that stimulus check uh, on sex toys. Drug, I mean, spend them on drugs. Drugs for, you know, buy, so help your local friendly drug dealer. Just fucking stand in solidarity. That's what you got to do. You got to stand in solidarity with these Amazon strikers and uh, uh, buy drugs from your local drug dealer. That's, that's the way that we move America forward. <laughs> But these workers, they're asking for um, a shutdown of the of these Amazon warehouses um, to do a deep clean, to do a thorough deep clean, um, and offer the employees two weeks with pay. And that's probably where they're having a problem. They're just like, we're not going to make any money. We're not going to make this astronomical amount of money by by trying to be opportunistic about fear, by saying that there's never going to be any sort of consumer good ever again. If you don't support Amazon today, if you don't support Amazon today, you'll be done. It'll be done. There'll be no more TVs, no more laptops, no more cables, no more headphones, no more dildos. It'll be over. We can't utilize that fear to make these employees work slave hours. How dare you? And they want Amazon to only put out essential items, <laughs> right? Like put a pause on non-essential items um, while we're in the situation. Now, um, Amazon is the, the Staten Island case that I talked about earlier. It, it, Amazon, that's not the only one that they hid. 130 cases were reported from Amazon warehouses. Uh, 30, over 30 confirmed. Over 30 of them were confirmed cases of COVID-19. And they still haven't taken any actions to sanitize these places, to uh, offer better, to offer just healthcare, to just pay for it, testing, nothing. They still make them work as much as they work, still make them work in the conditions that they have to work in. And, and this big claim that, oh, but we care. We care so much about our employees. We care about our, our customers. That's why whenever people get diagnosed with this highly commutable disease, then people are touching and coughing and sneezing on all of this stuff and putting it into a box and sending it out to the people. We care about them. We care about the customer. That's why we let these people sneeze into the boxes and send out just germ-covered dildos. That's, that's because we care. So these workers are planning a sick out on April 24th uh, over the work conditions. And not only that, uh, but over the firing of two tech people that complained about the, uh, that, that not complained, but criticized the work conditions of Amazon, criticized the climate uh, that Amazon has as a corporation. Uh, and uh, what's going to happen now is Jeff Bezos is going to be paying um, for a legislation to ban all of the mirrors in America so that he doesn't have to look at himself in the mirror ever again. He never has to self-reflect. All, all reflective surfaces are now banned and they will be covered with left paint, lead paint. So says God King Bezos and we have to do it. Cover it all with the lead paint. It's for the benefit, not just for the God King, but also for you. Nobody wants to look at themselves just enjoy this gift that the God King has given you.
here's the amazing thing, right? These these workers are put in conditions where there's 500, 700 employees in, a, in, in these warehouses, right? Trying to meet these orders, meet these demands, which is probably why it's like, if you want to stand in solidarity with these fucking Amazon workers, you should. And you should stop ordering shit from Amazon. You don't need to watch the next season of The Boys from Amazon. Okay, fucking, you don't need to have Amazon Prime. There's like 900 different streaming services. Subscribe to YouTube channels from independent comedians that are losing their eyesight for you. <laughs> but they, but they're just like 500 to 700 people that are in a lot of these warehouses. And in a lot of these places, they have to stand shoulder to shoulder. You know, they, 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 sometimes they don't give them masks. Sometimes they don't give them gloves and they are sick and they have to cough and they have to sneeze and that, that you know, they're not practicing social distancing things. Yet, the organizer of the, of the original strike in Staten Island gets fired for not practicing social distance. Yet, this is how, this is how the corporation that fired somebody for not, hand, not practicing social distancing actually behaves. And they're going to do what Andrew Carnegie did to, 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 to Frick, right? They'll blame the managers. They'll be like, oh, the warehouse managers are the problem. We, we, t we said social distancing guidelines, you know? We said that. We said it. But these managers, look at them. They don't care. They don't care. This is a, a safety protocol because the, because the, the, the upper, upper management, you know, the, the oligarchical management, the, the Bezoses and, and the spokespeople that we hire and the PR reps and the CFOs and the CTOs, we care. We love these. We love our customers. You know, we don't want them. We say social distancing, but look at these managers. And then they throw the managers under the fucking bus. And that Stockholm Syndrome kicks back in. That American Stockholm Syndrome kicks back in. There's an Amazon spokesperson that came out to talk about this, uh, the strikes and the conditions, the work conditions, and she literally said these accusations are unfounded as she put a blindfold around her face. And a vast amount of employees showed up to work. A vast amount of employees showed up to work. Yeah, because they're fucking scared, dude. They're scared to lose their job. They're scared to lose what little income that they have. They're scared to lose their health care for their families because they're not employees. They're hostages. They're enslaved hostages. We are like this close to Jeff Bezos coming out with his own money so that his employees can go to a Whole Foods and, you know, use that play money to buy a cookie. Your whole day's wages can be used for buying a cookie. I'm surprised that Jeff Bezos hasn't tried to just purchase like an apartment complex to try to house his fucking employees. Like it hasn't gone down that route. This is what they did with the coal miners. I'm astounded we haven't gotten to that point yet. And, and he might have plans to do that. I don't know. He might have plans to fucking buy up some real estate, right? To construct a, you know, like a, a small apartment. And he's like, for, um, for, for, for just, you know, 10% of the Bezos bucks that I'm going to pay you, for just 10% of that, you get to live in this luxury studio closet that I'm graciously providing you as your god kink and you get to shop at the Whole Foods with a bunch of other people regular people and some of these people they might be rich you get to be amongst the riches isn't that amazing we are giving you the luxury to do that I mean this is the attitude that he has so Amazon's not the only one, right? We talked about Target being the other one. Um, Target is also staging a sick out. Uh, they're doing it on May 1st, May Day, uh, International Workers' Day, uh, because Target is not taking care of their employees as well either. Um, I think it's like 30 grocery store employees have uh, died 
because of uh, because of COVID nineteen, because of being exposed to this thing. They probably got exposed. They probably got sick, uh, and couldn't take the days off, so they had to come into work and uh, you know strain their body and strain their mind, get stressed out. Come, you know, their immune system gets uh, their, their their immunity gets decreased because there's too much stress. And since the stimulus, a lot of the, um, a lot of the, the, the part-time employees, because that's what they, they end up being part-time employees, uh, they end up um, seeing more customers. And my mom works at, um, at Target, and I'm, you know, it's like they're, they're, the disrespect and the, the, the craziness and the anger and the entitlement of these customers has just gone through the fucking roof through the roof and, and even in the article they talk about this right even even these people that are that are talking about this in the article that i read on usa today was was talking about how you know the, the customers have gotten far more rude um they've gotten uh they've gotten way angrier and they've uh, like the, just like people spitting on each other and shit like that's crazy you should treat these people with respect you should be treating these people with kindness, regardless of whether we're in a pandemic or not, by the way. Regardless of whether we're in a pandemic or not, you should be treating them. So there is a employee activist um, program uh, called Target, Target, the Target Workers Unite. Um, and they put out this sick out pledge, right? So let's read this sick out pledge. Let's see here. So there's a document. We'll run through what this document says as well. Uh, it says, by taking this pledge, you are committing to stand in solidarity with other target team members and workers across the nation who know our jobs still remain unsafe during the COVID-19 pandemic. At Target, the foot traffic and guest behavior has been atrocious, putting us at needless risk when greater safety measures are required to ensure social distancing. Workers nor guests have been required to wear masks. Uh, I will say that, the, that they did give my mom masks um, and gloves, uh, you know, so they, and then, and then like, I think like a week ago, they installed the plexiglass stuff. So, you know, over like a, like a month and a half after all this shit goes down they're like yeah we'll fucking give you gloves and shit like that uh our maximum capacity of guests have been set too high uh yeah it's like 450 people are allowed to go into a target where like trader joe's and like i i i, I usually go to trader joe's which is where i get this glassware from <laughs> as you can see the the label's still on it and i use it to drink my coffee and my water um, but I go to Trader Joe's, um, and they, you know, have, you have to wait and there's maybe 25, 30 people in there at a time, maybe, um, which obviously is going to decrease their profits, but it's going to increase the safety. Um, so let's continue our, our maximum capacity of guests has been set too high. Their demeanor is also casual and reckless. They do not respect our space. They are not coming into stores exclusively for essential items, but are occupying our stores out of boredom or for fun, which is which is so crazy. I've never fucking understood this thing, right? Like when I was a teenager, I used to be a little mall rat. I get I get that. I worked in a mall, so I would always like hang out there afterwards. You know, like my friends would come see me after I would work and we would hang out at the mall. We'd go to the Hot Topic and check out the band shirts, whatever the fuck, right? Like, we do dumb teenager shit. But, like, if you're, like, an adult person, like, you don't need to go hang out in a mall. You don't need to go hang out in a fucking shopping center. Like, that's not a thing that you need to do as an adult. Like, if you need to go walk around, if you need to be outside, go the fuck outside. Like, walk around your neighborhood. You know? Like, go... You know, it'd be with nature for a minute. Check out some trees. Breathe some fresh air. Don't fucking go to a Target and then be shitty to an employee because you're bored. Find, find a hobby. Holy shit, can you find a hobby? Maybe do some self-reflection 
instead of going to Target, which is just like such a what an obsessive. This is so. This is such proof that fucking people are just obsessed, just obsessed with capitalism. That even when you can't spend money, even when you don't need to be in an, in a fucking church for capitalism, in a church for shopping in these fucking huge monoliths that you need to go spend your money in, even when you can't spend your money at those places, that's where you choose to go. You do not need to fucking do that. You just go anywhere else. Holy shit. Sit outside on a park bench for 10 minutes and think about yourself. Do some self-reflection. You know, call your sister, call your mother, call somebody. Have a conversation. Reconnect with a friend. Learn a new skill. Watch a fucking show. Subscribe to Independent Comedian's YouTube channels. <laughs> uh, hey, I'm allowed to be selfish every once in a while. Even if it is, even if it's just me kind of fucking around a little bit. The guest's desire for recreation are not more important than the team member's needs for safety. Our pay and compensation are not adequate enough to cover the costs of hospitalization or funeral expenses related to COVID-19. They got a $2 uh, an hour pay raise during COVID-19. That's their hazard pay. Hazard pay is supposed to be double what you normally make. Double. Which would push it closer to $15 an hour. Like, even with hazard pay... If you're getting minimum wage, you're still not getting $15 an hour. Which, by the way, is not what minimum wage should be. If it keeps up with inflation, I think it should be like $22 or $24 an hour. Uh, it should be far higher. In 2001, when, when the idea of increasing the minimum wage to $15 an hour, yeah, that made sense. But now it's like, you gotta be, the, the minimum wage needs to be way higher than that. Uh, so this is why the target team members are engaging in a massive sick out and exercising our rights to refuse unsafe work conditions as defined by the Occupational Safety and Hazards Act, OSHA, General Duty Clause, which states in Section 5A1, each employer shall furnish to his employees, which is like you can just say their employees, maybe update the list a little to, you know, be inclusive. Uh, employees employment and a place of employment which are free from recognized hazards that are causing or are likely to cause death or serious physical harm to their employees by engaging in concerted activity with fellow team members we are also exercising our rights to organize and strike as defined by section 7 of the Na national labor relation act we talked about that uh, a little bit yesterday when we were talking about the Taft-Hartley Act as well, which tried to fight back against a lot of this stuff. Um, these federal laws ban any employer from illegal retaliation, including wrongful termination, reduction of hours, demotion, etc., against any employee who exercises these rights. We will file charges for any retaliatory action against, uh, and their representatives may engage it may engage in towards workers exercising these rights. Target Workers Unite calls on all team members to join us this May 1st, International Workers Day, along with workers across industries and across the nation to fight for our lives and ensure our safety. So, and then you can fill, and then if you're a Target employee, you can fill out this form. Um, it asks for a pledge, it asks for your phone number, and then it's gonna, it also, they also ask you about uh, recovering lost wages, so they might be able to help um, and recovering um, lost wages. They're, they're also helping you organize the strike, um, training people about labor labor strikes and stuff like that during uh, a sick out. Uh, so, you know, they are providing uh, a way to help people throughout, while, they're, while they're getting people to strike. Uh, so I think that's a very cool thing. And I think, once again, you should be in solidarity with these striking uh, employees. You should stand with them. Um, and I hope that people will, because this is important. Again, this is about the future. This is about making these workplaces better. This is about holding these corporations accountable and saying, we're not going to let you get away with shit just because you're a big business. 
fuck your team of lawyers fuck your your investments fuck your your new york stock exchange points none of that shit matters you're not treating us people properly and that's what we're going to fight for there's going to be a lot of people that are going to sit there and and oh you know and where you'll you'll never see those people that were out protesting this weekend at any of these things you'll you will not see those people coming in and standing in solidarity with these strikers champions of liberty are going to stand in side by side with fucking amazon because they have stockholm syndrome with these corporations because they're not trying to say reopen the country they're trying to say reopen the country so we can go back to work so that we can go back to being corporate slaves they're not pushing back against the corporatocracy. They're not pushing back against the oligarchy. They should be encouraged to. If you want to strike, if you want to be out there on the streets and protest something, protest this. Protest unfettered capitalism. Protest a, a, a mistreatment of the working class. The failures of both the Democratic and the Republican Party to actually help the worker. To actually help the people protest that fight for a better America fight for freedoms with logic behind it fight for a compassionate economy we move on now to our final story <laughs> um, our final story has to deal with uh, YouTube censorship of uh, Graham Elwood. If you're unfamiliar with Graham Elwood, and I, I doubt that you guys are unfamiliar with Graham Elwood. There might be a couple people that are. Uh, Graham is a fantastic comedian. He has a YouTube channel uh, called The Political Vigilante. Uh, as you might see, that I've called myself The uh, Social Vigilante, which was not a name that I gave to myself, by the way. That is... Uh, a name that somebody else gave to me and I and I decided to like use it because I thought it was kind of badass um, So, you know Graham calls himself the political vigilante. I found out about that years ago I found out about that when my buddy Ron Placone started touring with Graham actually so this was um, You know three maybe three years ago or something like that uh, But I like Graham uh, Graham's YouTube channel is great. He covers a, a, a lot of uh, again this sort of information that you're not going to hear about in the corporate media you're you're not going to hear the corporate media talk about um you know why we need to have a rent strike why we need to support labor movements why socialism isn't a bad word why capitalism unfettered capitalism is 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 a parasite and a plague upon humanity you know um why we need to stand in solidarity together as a, as a collective working class. That's, that's all stuff that you're not going to get. You're going to get from independent uh, comedians <laughs> and journalists. Um, and, and Graham is one of them. Uh, Graham has a great channel. Uh, I highly recommend people subscribe to Graham Elwood. Uh, he's also on Rockfin. I've been trying to get on Rockfin. I haven't gone on Rockfin yet. It's a crypto-based video site. Uh, where every person that uh, gets approved for Rockfin is a uh, is also like it's like a they're also like employees so it's like a, it's like we also own a part of Rockfin they kind of democratize the platform uh, which is great which is what we need um, so on Easter Graham's live stream got taken down and uh, they claim that it was for violating community standards. He gives a lot more detail about it on his channel. Um, and, I, and I would highly encourage you guys to go check out all the details on his channel. But basically, it was just vague. He, you know, hey, you violated community standards, so we, can't, we stopped the live stream in the middle of it. And he does a live stream where he, uh, he answers questions. Uh, and he did, talks about articles and, you know, stuff like that. Uh, it's very fun. It's cool to watch. I, I enjoy it. And whenever I get, get some time, you know, whenever I'm kind of uh, sending messages or emails, I, I listen to them. Although the email sending now is a lot less uh, than it is now that I'm not touring or contacting press for my tours or contacting groups to come out to see my tours. Um, which, uh, uh, as I'm saying that, I'm just like, God damn it, I really want to get back on the road. But it's fine. We'll get there. Uh, we will be able to get back to touring. I will be able to see all my friends across the country. Um, 
and uh, and and yell about the oligarchy uh, at your faces uh, through a microphone. Um, but um, you know, uh, I would wa- that's when I would watch Gra- Graham's live streams, and they're fun. I again, they're super fun. They're super informative. They are very entertaining. Um, but they canceled one of his live streams. Just shut it down. Uh, didn't put it up. And, uh, and they said he was violating community standards. So he contacted them. And, uh, you know, there's no real person to, to help right now. Um, and I want to point out this. YouTube did put out a disclaimer at the beginning of COVID-19. I think I caught this maybe, oh boy, when the fuck did I catch this? The couple days afterwards. So it might have been like a week after. Um, you know, some stay-at-home orders had been placed. The social distancing orders had been in place. Bars and restaurants had been closed. Uh, and after that, I saw YouTube post a little little thing uh, on the back end where, you know, the, they call it the studio, the YouTube studio, where you upload your videos and stuff like that. And it was basically saying that the algorithm is going to decide what is and isn't acceptable because of COVID-19. They don't have you know, like a real person to adjudicate. So this is the actual message that they said. Uh, I don't know if you can see the whole thing. I did try to pop out one or two of the things. Um, It says, due to COVID-19, we will conduct fewer human reviews to protect the health of our extended workforce. Unfortunately, as a result, we may remove content that does not violate our community standards, does not violate our community standards and this is kind of a bullshit statement because this basically says we are going to practice in censorship uh and um and that's it not much you can do about it COVID-19 you know COVID-19 is happening guys you know, we can't, we got to be safe with our employees. It's like, wait a minute. Why can't your employees? I feel like YouTube should be one of those things where you should be able to work from home, where you don't need to be at an office. But if they say that, then that means that they don't need that huge fucking where, you know, their, their building with their gyms and their whatever the fuck crazy shit that they have in their non-essential shit. Right. This is an opportunistic way of saying if there's content on YouTube that we don't particularly care for, we will just make up some shit. We will just say some shit that it violates our community guidelines and we don't have a human reviewer. So we're just going to fucking take it down and there's nothing you can do about it because we're in a crisis. We're in a global pandemic. Boo hoo hoo. There's nothing you can do about it. Too bad, so sad. And who are the people that are going to suffer because of it? Is it MSNBC? CNN? Is it Fox News? Late Night with Stephen Colbert? The Late Late Show with uh, James Corden where he fucking paraded Nancy Pelosi's ice cream cavern? That offensive shit? Nah going to be Graham Elwood. It's going to be me. It's going to be Ron Placone, Lee Camp, you know, Gray Zone with Anya Parmpil, Act Out with Eleanor Goldfield, all these independent people. That's who they're going to target. And they're going to say, well, there's nothing we can do about it. All of our human people are, are, they're not working anymore. They can't look at this. They can't see whether you did or didn't violate community standards or not. So if you do some anti-establishment shit, if you talk about the technocracy, if you talk about working class people, there's a chance we might just delete your shit. And there's nothing you can do about it. I've noticed certain little things. I've noticed that I'll wake up and I'll check my view count on YouTube, you know, just to check it. I'll check the thing and it'll one of the videos will say like 22 views and then I'll come back you know I'll upload a few things and I'll refresh the page and then it'll all of a sudden that same video will say 12 views and it's like where'd those views go 
can't complain. Like, who am I going to fucking go talk to? Uh, D- Graham does mention that he that he's in touch with uh, somebody that might be able to help him because, like, bigger channels. Like, Jimmy Dore has a huge channel, so there is a guy uh, that is helping him out. And Graham talks about that more in depth on his channel. Uh, again, go check that video out. I recommend it. But, you know, the reason I want to bring this up is very similar situation to what happened with me and Spotify last month. Um, I don't know if you guys caught it, but basically what happened is I got a copyright claim. I tried to find out what was going on with that copyright claim, and uh, Spotify never got back to me about it. Uh, my former, the, the, I, I was with Anchor.fm as my podcast host. Um, they never got back to me about it, and then 48 hours later, straight up deleted my podcast. No warning, no reason behind it, just a vague copyright claim that they wouldn't tell me about. To this day, they've not told me anything about. To this day, I don't know why I got a copyright claim on my podcast that did, that got them to just fucking delete my entire podcast. My RSS feed was gone. F- fucking over 300 episodes, five years worth of work, just blipped out. Ron Pacone had me on his show to talk about it, which is very cool. Hard Lens Media, they had me on the show to talk about it, which was very cool. But the same thing. Disappeared an entire episode. Vague. Oh, violating community guidelines. Oh, you got a copyright claim. Can you explain what that is? And this is before the crisis, too. What, what happened to me was before this COVID-19 crisis happened. So they weren't on a skeleton crew. They weren't sending people home with no access to whatever, you know, if they're claiming like, oh, we can't give people access to our servers or what have you. Um, So Spotify had the employees to do it. They restored my podcast, and then I moved it immediately to Libsyn, uh, which has meant that I'm going to, you know, I I have to pay for the hosting. And part of the reason why I chose Anchor was because I didn't have to pay for the hosting, but if that gives them an easier access to delete my podcast over vague copyright claim, because Anchor is also owned by Spotify, um, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to chance it. So, uh, you know, it's important to talk about this because who's next? And are we going to notice? Are we going to do something about it? Because what if tomorrow, not that this, but let's say Tucker Carlton says something anti-establishment, what happens to his channel? I mean, he'd be fired first. But, um, you know, do we want YouTube to be making these sort of decisions? And they're doing this during a pandemic right now because of a skeleton crew. But they've been doing shit like this before the pandemic. I mean, like I said, the Spotify thing happened before the pandemic. And there's hundreds and hundreds of stories of people's videos getting taken down, demonetized, people's entire channels disappearing. Well, well before the 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 pandemic happened and 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 now it's just an opportunistic reason to say well it's the pandemic we're on a skeleton crew we can't get to all these things bullshit you are actively censoring people you are actively going against the first amendment you are actively letting people not express their voices because you disagree with what they have to say because they criticized your platform and that that is unconstitutional, and that is un-American. That's some anti-freedom shit right there. And we need to stand up to that. We need to stand up to this bullshit. We need to stand up to this. As a result, we will we may remove content that does not violate our community guidelines and then do fucking nothing about it. No. None of that says we will take care of this once we are out of this situation. None of that says we will we will improve the ranking of your video if your video is wrongfully removed from our platform for this vague violation of community guidelines. They don't give you a way to to get out of this situation. They're just like, it's going to happen and we're going to fucking do it. And now this, this gives them an opportunistic reason to censor content that they don't like. 
and uh, and you know, tap dots to keep an eye out on it. I, I do think that the, we would have seen a lot more had there not been an increase in uh, watching online content. <laughs> So, um, yeah, so there's that, uh, you know, so, uh, keep your eye out for it and, and keep supporting your independent, um, uh, content creators, um, because they're the ones that are going to get targeted by this shit the most. All right. With that said, folks, that is the end of this episode. Uh, and, uh, thank you guys for spending the 90 minutes that, that these episodes have become, um, I hope you guys are enjoying them. I hope you guys are, are, are finding them entertaining. Um, and, uh, you know, keep leaving comments. Uh, keep community. Yeah, I, I like reading the comments. I like reading. And I'll, I'll respond to those comments as well. Um, if you can make a donation, please do. Uh, you know, right now, this is pretty much what I'm doing full time. And I understand everybody's kind of in a tough bind. So the donations are not a necessity. Uh, they do help a lot. They're an extra source of appreciation. You can make a one-time donation. You can make a sustaining membership. Uh, but there are, um, you know, uh, different things coming up that I'm doing to kind of diversify the uh, the entertainment portfolio that I've got going on. Uh, one of them being the, the test show that I'm going to be doing on Saturday. Uh, like I said, it's going to be a short test show, um, not a super long one. Uh, but it'll basically help me kink out some technical specs that I need to keep an eye out for. It'll give you a little bit of an idea about the formatting and how that's going to work. It'll give me an idea of, of what the audience feedback is going to sound like. Uh, the test show is free. It's limited to 10 people Saturday, 8.30 p.m. Um, I will send out a email with all of the information an hour before the show. So that's why I'm asking people to get those tickets, even though they're free. Uh, and we'll figure out a day that we can do them as well. Um, what else? I'm also going to be coming out with my new album. Uh, that's coming out June 1st. Uh, I will have an event for that once all the things um, get ready. Uh, I, I all the links and the distributions are done. And uh, they're going to be available on my Bandcamp page. And there's a couple reasons why you should probably get the album from Bandcamp over anything else. One... Uh, Bandcamp's the only place where there's going to be uh, a bonus track available on the album. Uh, two, there's going to be a bonus disc uh, of the album that's only exclusively available on Bandcamp. And three, it'll be available as pay what you want. And uh, if you do have the ability to, to, to make a donation to that, 100% of that goes to, to me and to the artist, essentially. So Bandcamp is giving 100% of the revenue back to the artist. Um, so they are the most artist-friendly platform to download and or stream music from so that's why i highly recommend going to the band camp um and uh yeah other than that um you know stay tuned follow the page make sure you're subscribed uh make sure you hit that like make sure you hit the share button if you can uh all big ways that you can help the show all big ways that you can get the show out to more people uh what else did I want to say? Oh, I'll, you know, Taboo Table Talk, that's coming out tomorrow. Uh, I will be doing a small business series on Taboo Table Talk, uh, talking to small businesses and so on and so forth. So, um, yeah, thank you guys for tuning in. I appreciate it. I love you guys. Uh, and uh, till Friday, or the next video will be up on Friday because I'm taking Thursdays off. Uh, the next video is up on Friday. We'll see you Friday. Bye, guys. Take care.